I'm excited you guys are here today. We've been in this series called Perfect Peace, and, and really it's been a journey uh, that we've been on, allowing God to challenge us and to reveal areas where maybe we've gotten comfortable, where we've gotten like comfortable with the stress, comfortable with the anxiety, comfortable with the, 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 the worry and the doubt, and just like, like it's commonplace, but, but learning like maybe there is more to this life and to our peace that we're just not accessing. And so it's been a journey that God's just revealing and healing. And, and, and we're challenged by this word, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, where God says, he will keep us in perfect peace. And, and wow, is that, is that possible? And we're finding out that, that peace isn't the absence of problems. It's the presence of God in the middle of the problem. So I, I can have like challenges and I can even have uncertainty, which a lot of people are asking me right now about next year and the climate of the economy and the uncertainty of things. And, and if you look to those things and you look to economy or if you look to resources, if you look to people, all those things change, but God never changes. There is a source of perfect peace that we can have in the middle of the uncertainty, in the middle of all the challenges. God says, he will keep you in perfect peace, all who trust in him and whose thoughts are, are fixed on him. We're in part five of this series. If you missed any, go catch them online. I think you'll be blessed by all of them as they kind of all peel back different onion layers of our life and our heart today. Uh, let me set up where we're going. Jesus was telling a parable. He oftentimes taught in parables, and sometimes they were confusing, and the disciples would come to him afterwards, and they'd, they'd ask like, hey, what did you mean? And this is one of those parables called the parable of the sower. Some of you might be familiar with it. Jesus told this parable that there was this farmer who scattered seed on different soils, and the meaning of the pair was actually the farmer was God, and the seeds were the word of God, and the soils were the different heart conditions that were receiving the word of God. And Jesus tells them that this parable that God actually sows his word out, and some of the soils and some of the seed, the word of God, it lands on, on hard soil. So some people have a hard heart, and they can't receive the word of God, the promises of God. It just doesn't penetrate their heart. And then he says, well, some of the seeds, some of the word, it lands on rocky soil because some people have competing things all in their heart just like crowding out the room there's just no room for God in their heart so the word doesn't bear the fruit it's intended to in their life and then there was another seed that he said had weeds in it and uh that the seed of the word actually landed in the soil and it grew but it only grew for a short while because these weeds that were in the garden choked out the word of God, and I want to share with you today about that soil, that heart posture, the weeds of the soil. We're going to do some gardening today. I think every single one of us, every single one of us, myself included, hey, we got some weeds, okay? And there's, there is a need for us to just, uh, every now and then, to till the soil of our heart, to identify some things that are crowding out, choking out the word of God from bearing fruit in our life. And then I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you why this is connected to, to peace right now. Mark chapter 4, Jesus is explaining this specific soil, uh, the soil that had weeds in it. And this is what he says it is. He says, actually, the, the weeds are the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things. That's what's actually coming in and choking out the word from your life, making it unfruitful. Okay, so that word worry in that scripture, some of your Bible translation translates that word cares of this world, of this, this life. I looked up that word, your New Testament is written in Greek, so that Greek word is actually two. It's two Greek words combined together, and here's what it means. Check this out. The first word is divided, and the second word is mind, or heart, or heart that we have this divided heart and mind that, that like sometimes I believe God, but sometimes I don't. I kind of like, I, I, I want this, but I also want that. And we got this divided. So there's this, I was reading this story of this, this guy who actually lost his, 
arm in this accident, and, and he didn't let it limit him. It's a really cool story that he kind of just continued to do adventures and exercises and stuff like that just to kind of push himself and challenge himself. He took up wall ball. How many of y'all ever play wall ball? Anyone ever take up wall ball? That's a hard, like it, you get tired on, you're hitting the racket, the little ball like with, with your hand instead of a racket. This guy with one arm joins this, like it's like he starts to do it like, professionally, or maybe not professionally, but semi-professionally against others where they have tournaments and stuff like that. And he becomes the best in the state. And, and so they interview him. They're like, how, what do you attribute this? How are you who seemingly are at a disadvantage? How are you beating people who have both the extremities and you have the one? He goes, it's easy. When the ball comes off the wall, all my opponents have to decide, am I going to use my right hand or my left? And he said, before, before the ball's coming at me, I already know what hand I'm going to use. Okay, so uh, here, what, what we need, some of us have too many, we have our mind divided, too many options. Things come at us in our life, and you're like, I, I kind of want to do this, okay, this is a, but I also want this. And, and Jesus makes this connection to this divided heart that we live with, this divided mind. He makes an intentional connection to the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things and stuff, that that's actually what's causing the division of your mind and choking out the promises of God, God's word from bearing fruit in your life. I believe that this is robbing so many people of peace, the deceitfulness of wealth, the pursuit of stuff and things. Here's what the title of today's message is. Money lies to the divided mind. Money lies to the divided mind. You all know that financial tension and strain is the number one cause still of divorce today. At least that is the excuse. The biggest thing that Washington, D.C. is arguing about, like right now, what are they arguing about? They're always arguing about money, right? What do we do with it? Who's going to get it? How are we going to spend it? Uh, there was this book called The Day America Told the Truth that they pulled Americans, a whole bunch of Americans, and, and they asked these Americans this question. What would you do for $10 million? Right? Some of y'all are thinking like, "Woo! what would I do? So, so this is what they found out, that Americans, check this out, 25% of Americans would abandon their entire family. <laughs> oh, man. 23% would become a prostitute for a week or more. 16% would give up their American citizenship. 10% would withhold testimony, letting a murderer go free. 7% would kill a total stranger. Right? You don't know who's in your row right now. You better watch out, okay? Contract killers. 3% would put their children up for adoption. Some of you are like, nah, I'll do it for free. You know, here's the kid. Say, I'll pay you. Let me write a check. How much are you going to take this kid for? I'm just kidding. Some of you kids that are in the room, you're a blessing of God. Don't. Just kidding. <laughs> here's, but we, we, here's, here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that what's robbing you of peace and this division of mind, it's the deceitfulness of wealth and the pursuit of other things. So I want to talk about this. I want to talk about what the money lies and the pursuit of stuff, what that does and what it's causing to our, to our life. There are three primary lies. I think and every one of us have heard these lies from money, I'm calling them just money lies, the three top lies that money, money will tell us. If you buy into it, if you buy into it, it's going to divide your mind and take your peace. Are you hearing me, guys? It's going to divide your mind and take your peace. So let me give you the top three money lies. Write these down. Number one, money, we believe the lie. Money will make me secure. That's what's going to happen. If I have it or if I have enough of it, I can insulate my life to such a degree that, that nothing can, if I had a lot of it, we even have a word for it being financially secure, right? As if I would be secure enough if I had more of it. No, that's ridiculous. I mean, it's okay for you to have money. It's just not okay for money to have you. Proverbs 18, 11 says this, the wealth of the rich is their fortified city. So I'm going to build my own fortress. Listen, God says that his name is a strong tower that we would run to, but no, no, no. I can't trust that. I got to build my own fortress, my own fortress. And it says they imagine it a wall. 
too high to scale. And they imagine it because it's not real. It's in our imagination. If I had enough riches and I can build a tall enough wall that no one can scale it, I can insulate and protect myself from anyone getting in and causing harm. So sickness and disease and illness and grief and loss, it's ridiculous to think that riches will prevent you from the calamity or the troubles of this life. Yet we buy into it. Money's what you need to be secure. That's what you need. You just need, you need some more, more money. The CEO of Apple, the late CEO, uh, uh, Steve Jobs, he was towards the end of his life, because he died, he died way too young, you guys, but the end of his life, he was actually recorded saying, I wish I would have done it differently. That I actually put my hope in, in money thinking it could save me, but if I would, do it, I would do it over, I would put my hope in something other than money. It, it does not create security. Hebrews 13 says this, keep your lives free from not just money, but from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, let me be your fortress. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. My employer is not my helper. This government is not my helper. My help comes from God. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? If God be for me, who can be against me? Money will lie to you. The second lie money will tell you is that money will make you feel more significant. Like, like, like we wrap our identity into our possessions and our cars and our stuff, man. We think like, if I just drive, if I had the right car, people would treat me differently. They would respect me if I drove. If I had the right house or if I, if I, put, if I had the right clothes, man, people would treat me. You know, I, I get the respect. So, so we try to let things define us to, to, to get significance and even identity from the things of this world. Look what Luke chapter 12, 15. Jesus says, beware, like be on your guard against every kind of greed, meaning there's more kinds of greed, okay? This is actually trying to get significance from other things is a form of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Don't even go there. That's a lie because the enemy's trying to get you to trust it instead of trusting God. Here's the third lie, and that is money will make me happy. Oh, I mean, we've, we've, we've all bought into these in one degree or another, and because of it, it divided our mind and stole our peace. It robbed us money. Well, if that were true, come on, you guys. If that were true, then the richest people on this earth would be the happiest people. And you know it ain't true, right? That's not true. The richest people on this, this earth are the most miserable people on the planet, you guys, because you know what stuff does? Stuff gives you an appetite for more stuff. You think it would quench it, but it doesn't. It just gives you more discontentment with the stuff you have. That's what it does. Any of you like watching Shark Tank? Yeah, Shark Tank's a fun show, man. It's a fun. I like that guy, Robert Hershevik. He's, he's, he, he's one of my favorite sharks. But one time he was talking to this guy, this dude, this entrepreneur, trying to get them to invest in his, his, his thing, you know. And he tells him, and he was trying to motivate him. And he goes, you know what? I, I get three hours of sleep every night. I get up earlier than I get him back up because that's what it's going to take. And I thought to myself, that does not sound appealing at all. What a miserable life that this man who is a billionaire is, has no peace, is robbing himself of one of the most glorious things that God has given us. Come on, somebody, sleep, hallelujah. I need, I like my, my eight hours, I like my eight hours, okay? I can survive on six for a minute, but you know, you got to get my eight in there, okay? God gives rest to those he loves, okay? Why this pursuit, though? Because the more a person has, the more they want. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, those who love money will never have enough. How absurd to think that wealth can actually bring you true happiness. That's not going to, you know it's not happening. It doesn't happen for them. It ain't going to happen for you. Again, God's not saying you can't have it. Just don't let it have you. Okay, you really want to be happy? Look at Romans chapter 4. Happy are those, happy are they whose sins are forgiven, whose wrongs are pardoned. Happy is the person whom the Lord does not consider guilty. Aren't you glad you're free today? Someone give God some praise for the freedom they have in Christ. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 6 and 9 tells us it's better to be satisfied with what you have rather than always wanting something else. This is the law of contentment right here that we're talking about. And I just want to quickly show you what the Bible says the effects are of always wanting more. Because here's how he says, what's dividing your mind is the deceitfulness of wealth and, and always wanting more, the desire for other things and stuff. And these things, you buy into it, 
It'll divide your mind and rob your peace. So let me show you, there's five things that the Bible says. All these scriptures come from Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, the wisdom literature, five things that are gonna happen if you buy into this like, oh, I just need more. The effect of always wanting more. Here it is. Number one is you're gonna get more fatigue. You're gonna be more tired. So you're always wanting more. You're always working harder. You're always gonna get it earlier, get, get ahead. Being tired all the time is a symptom of doing too much and trying to do too much. That race, that drive for more and more, it drives you to overwork. There was a story or a, a poem written by Tolstoy 100 years ago. He tells this story of this peasant who was working for this master, and the master tells him, I'll give you as much land as you can walk on for one whole day. This day, this day, whatever your feet step on the land, I give you the land. And so this guy gets to running. He's like, ah, he's run, ah, running all over the land, man. He's a big, and so he runs all day, all night, and to the end of the day, he dies of exhaustion. Which is, it's, it, the story is meaning to connect like how we as humans are so like, so striving for more and more and, and more. And I think there are so many of us, so many of us are like on the inside, we're dying of exhaustion. We're just trying to get more and more and more. And the first thing you're going to get if you buy into this lie of, of just the desire of more things, you're going to get more exhaustion. Proverbs 23 and 4 says, do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. So he's saying this is hey, it's dumb. It's foolish to wear yourself out trying to get more things. Like, Because even if you win the rat race, you're still a rat. <laughs> Not only does wanting more bring fatigue, it also brings, write this down, more expenses. I don't know if you realize that, but having more always costs more. It does, okay? I always like to say, like, if the grass is greener on the other side, it's because the water bill is, Okay? It cost some money. To, it, it, took, it took some cost to get that green grass. It looks good, but it costs something. Ecclesiastes 5.11, it says, the more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. Isn't that true? The more money you have, all of a sudden, now I need an accountant. You know, now I need a, now I need a, a housekeeper because I got to work harder to keep this stuff. You know, got to get the, the, my gardeners and my, someone to mow my lawn. The more money you have, the more, the more money you spend. The more money you have, the more people you have to spend it. So he says this. So what is the advantage of wealth? Except perhaps to watch it run through your fingers. I saw a bumper sticker that said, I used to dream of the salary I'm now starving on. Right, that ain't even funny. That's like a reality for so many people. Like you've been desiring so long this final position or this final promotion, this final salary, and you get there and after time you're like, you thought that would make ends meet. You're like, if I could just get there. And then you get to the place where you make the ends meet just to find out someone moved the end. You're like, what the heck? What happened here? You know? And you're like, well, I'm just trying to keep up with the Joneses. Stop it. The Joneses are filed for bankruptcy, Okay. The Joneses got a divorce. <laughs> stop, stop trying to follow the Joneses. Follow godly principles. That's what produces life, and that's what produces blessing. That's what produces peace. The, a lot of, we, we, think, we think that this pro, the real problem, you guys here, we think the problem is we're not making enough. The real problem is we want too much. That's, that's the real problem. So it brings more frustration, more fatigue, more expenses. Write this down. It also produces more anxiety. More anxiety. The more you have, the more you have to worry about it, right? If you don't have it, you ain't going to worry about it. Like, can I be honest with you? I don't worry at all about, about barnacles getting on my yacht. You know why? <laughs> I don't have a yacht. That's why. Okay? So what you don't have, you don't worry. But when you have it, man, now you're worried about it because now what you got to do, now I got to maintain it, now I got to protect it, now I got to insure it, now I got to, you know, clean it, now I got to, and, and I just got all this worries. I got to pay taxes on it. And so we have so many things that, that we can't even keep all of our things in our house anymore. We rent more space to put our things in. Right? Your storage units that you guys, may you ain't visiting and grabbing that stuff for years. What sense does this make to get more stuff just to put it away with the other stuff? But it was good. Yeah, I get it. But it wasn't good for long, right? Ecclesiastes 5.12 says, A working man can get a good night's sleep. But the rich man has so much that he stays awake worrying. What's he worrying about? 
how do I, how do I save it? How do I maintain it? How do I keep it? How do I defer my taxes on it? How do I, how do I, how do I, I read a study once that said that, that there's a connection between insomnia, like insomnia increases when your income increases. Isn't that crazy? That like the more you make, the more sleepless nights you're probably going to have. Why is that? Because you got more to worry about. Okay, so check this out. If you got more fatigue, more expenses, more anxiety, you know what that equals? Write this down. More conflict. That's what's happening. You're, you're going to have more conflict in your home because of these things. Because when you're, when you're tired and when you got more expenses and you're more anxious, you're going to have more fights. You're going to have more conflict. It causes more turmoil in your family. In fact, some of you grew up in homes where this was present, the deceitfulness and wealth and the desire for more stuff, like it caused so much tension and argument in the home you grew up in, but you didn't even, you didn't think that was a problem. Still probably even now, and I'm praying revelation, that you would identify the problem was actually the, the, maybe in your own home. You, the problem that you think is the problem ain't even the problem. The problem is you got a divided mind. You're deceived by wealth and you desire other things. Are you guys hearing me? Are you receiving this, you guys, today? More conflict. A greedy man brings trouble to his family, Proverbs 15, 27 says. We know that the, the studies continue to say the number one cause of divorce is financial tension. Every study shows that. It's no longer till death do us part. It's till debt do us part. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 says, People who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish, harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. That's talking about debt, financial ruin and destruction. People who are discontented are always looking for ways to make a fast buck. They're always falling for like quick, quick rich, you know, get rich quick schemes. And if it's too good to be true, it probably is, okay? Contented people don't fall for the, they don't, they don't, they're not lured by the lottery, don't elbow them right now, okay? That's later. You talk about that because you're, you're contented. Okay, here's, let me give you the last one, that this pursuit of more, this pursuit of more is going to cause, not only it's robbing your peace, dividing your mind, more dissatisfaction. Okay, we think having more is going to make us more happy, but like I said, having more is, we think it's going to make me more secure, more important, make me more loved, and none of that is true. But let me kind of, I'll concede a little bit here because I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are like, yeah, but... A million dollars would kind of make me happy, Pastor. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. So let me kind of, let me just kind of concede with you and, and, and agree that money can buy temporary happiness. Absolutely. I, I agree with that. It, it's, it, but it's, you have to realize that it is always, money can only buy temporary happiness. Happiness. Yes, you can go get that car. If you had all that money, you get that car you want it. You could. And, and what, what's going to happen? You're going to get in that car. You're going to feel good. You're getting the car. New car smell and stuff. You love that smell, right? How long does that new car smell last? Two weeks. That's how long. Unless you're like me and you get new car smell every time you wash your car. No, I'm just kidding. Like, even then, the chemical, like, that ain't the same new car smell. You smell a little bit of chemical in that thing, okay? So even, and then when you drive it off the lot, guess what? It depreciated $10,000, okay? You're $10,000 poorer the moment that you drive that off the lot. So it's, it's a temporary, you might feel good about yourself for a little bit, right? Well, I don't know. How long did you like that truck? One, two, three years until you're going, honey, look at that truck. You see the new trucks they got now? They make those... Those, those electronic ones that just, they got more power, more gas. Honey, you know what? Yeah, it's always, it's always temporary. It'll buy temporary. Ecclesiastes 5 and 10. Here's another translation. It says, if you love money, you will never be satisfied. If you long to be rich, you will never get all you want. So he says, it's useless. Somebody asked a wealthy man, how much does it take to make a man happy? You know what he said? Just a little bit more. It's like what Tom Brady said. You know what they asked Tom Brady? They said, hey, which of your seven Super Bowl rings, what was, what's your favorite ring? Remember what he said? The next one. And now he's lost his family, lost his health. Why? Deceitfulness of wealth and the desire and the pursuit for other things. So let me ask you a question. Just let's gut level honesty here. How many of you would say that you would like to have or live a life of less fatigue, less expenses, less anxiety, less conflict, and less dissatisfaction, and more peace. Anyone in here want to live that kind of life? Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's look at what Jesus says in the Gospels, and how do we counter, how do we counter 
the money lies to our divided mind. What, what, what do we do here? What does God's word tell us? Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21. Let's start here. Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves are just going to break in and steal. But store up for yourselves, look what he says, treasures in heaven that I can actually create wealth in heaven. Treasure. Like I, 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 I not only just treasure like here, like there should be some sending ahead. I can put treasures and wealth in the kingdom of heaven where moss and vermin don't destroy and where thieves aren't breaking and steal. Then he says this, look at this. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Look at that. Jesus is saying that the reason why your mind is divided is because you're trying to separate your treasure from your heart. Like, like you think that, that, okay, I got a relationship with God, and again, I love Jesus and stuff, but this is my work life. This is my money. And this, is my, this is my stuff. And this is the way, and I don't like invite him into this stuff. And God is going, no, 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 you don't get it. You can't do that. Your heart will always follow your treasure. It will always follow. So he says this, Psalm 62, verse 10. The psalmist says, though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. See, to Jesus, every time, he talked about like money a lot, but it was never really about money. It was always about the heart. It was always about the, the heart. So let me ask you a question. What's your heart set on today? Where, what's your heart set? If you just get the heart set on the right thing, then everything else will fall into order in your life. That begs the question then, what should we have our heart set on? Okay, if this is, if, if this is dividing my mind, and I'm buying into the wrong lies. And really the solution is I just got to set my heart on the right things. What does the Bible say I should set my heart on? Okay, three things that the scriptures tell us to set our hearts on, to not live duplicitous, to not have a double mind, a divided mind, a divided heart. You got to set your heart on the right thing. Here they are. Number one, the Bible tells us to set your heart on giving, not getting. Yeah, this is, this is hard, man. It's contradictory to our nature. But this is far more than just your finances. I'm talking about living an others-focused life, like asking yourself, like, how can I add value to others? How can I bless others? How can I make a difference in somebody else's life? Like, how can I use my time and my gifts and my, my resources and my treasures to just make a difference for God's glory, for God's kingdom? Acts 20, 35 says this. You'll not likely go wrong here if you keep remembering what your master said. You're far happier giving than getting. Yeah, and this is unnatural to our flesh, to the carnal nature. Like every one of us instinctively wants to satisfy our own needs. We, we want to meet our own needs. We want to do what's right and best for us. We think about getting rather than giving. But if you want to put your heart in the right place, in a place that actually makes the word of God come alive and produce fruit in your life, you must set your heart on giving Rather than getting, here's what God will do for you. If you can get your heart right and stop dividing it over money and letting money lie to you, here's what God says he'll do for you in 2 Corinthians 9, 11. That you will be made rich in every way. Now, it's not just talking about financial. Don't take the Bible out of context here. It's, he's talking about in every way, but for a very specific purpose, so that you can be generous on every occasion. Like God wants you to bear fruit. He wants you to be fruitful so that you can be a blessing to others. We have every season uh, at this time of the year around Thanksgiving and Christmas, we, we make available these random acts of kindness cards. They're out there in the lobby. And I just want you to, I want to kind of challenge you, like test this with me. If you've never done like a random act, just, just to bless somebody, serve somebody, make their day, I'm telling you, try it, test it, grab a card and bless somebody and just see if it's not better to give than to receive. I, was, uh, I grabbed the, these cards, these, and on the random acts of kindness cards, on the back of the card, it says, something extra to show you God loves you. That's it. It's just like, hey, you know, they, they look at the card, and they're like, oh my gosh, God's thinking about me. I was in the Starbucks drive through and I paid for the person, Starbucks behind, and I gave the card, and I said, just give them this card. And I drove away, and I'm telling you, it was, I was in, this was just last week, we had a, a pretty stressful week. I don't know if you see all the work that's happening here, but there was a, there was a lot going on. I had a lot of meetings and challenges and things, and, 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 and it was the morning. I said, you know what? I'm just going to pay for this. As I drove off, uh, you know, away after, I'm telling you, the peace of God came over me, settled my heart, settled my mind. My circumstances didn't change. The deadlines didn't, didn't change. The dollar amounts didn't change. But what changed was my heart set. 
I felt the peace of God come over my mind and my heart and settle me. And I just, just, just to know, like, that person could get a card, and they're going to, God's thinking about me. I don't know what's happening in their life. I, I don't, but God does. And it could have been like in the moment of their pain, in the moment of their challenge, in the moment of a a crisis or loss or grief or difficulty, for them to receive that in that moment could make the difference between life and death. Okay, so so where are we going to set our hearts if we we don't want to live with a divided mind and buy into the lies of of money and things? Well, you got to set your heart on giving, not getting. Number two, set your heart on true riches. Set your heart on true riches. Now, true riches or anything that lasts forever. The things of this earth, they're not true riches. This isn't true riches. All this is temporary. Like all that stuff you're buying for people on Christmas, all those presents you're getting, all of it's going to either burn out or break eventually, okay? It's going to be obsolete eventually, okay? That stuff is not true riches. There are only two things that will last forever. You know what they are? The Word of God and people. Okay, people are the most valuable assets on this planet. The word of God and people are the true riches that last forever. Here's what Jesus says in Luke 16. And let me kind of break this down. I'm going to sit here for a moment, verse 19, or verse 9 through 13, okay? I, and I have it in the New King James Version because it actually uses some words that other translations don't, and I'll show it to you. Look at what it says. He says, Jesus says, and I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. And, and he's, Jesus is going to use that word mammon three times in, this, in just these few verses. Some translations actually translate that as money, but they could put a capital M on money because it is actually a person. Jesus is talking about the spirit that is on your money. Did you know there's a spirit on your money? Okay, money is not uh, like a, um, just something that is like, what is it, separate from the things of God. It, it doesn't have, money either has, money, money either has God's spirit on it because you're practicing God's principles with it, or it has the spirit of the devil on it because you're not. The spirit of mammon. Money is, it's not, it's not indifferent. It's not like, ah, oh, yeah, those are just indifferent objects. No, there is a spirit on money. Jesus is teaching us here that the, the spirit is called mammon, okay? This unrighteous mammon. But some people, like, they, it's, this verse is hard because it says, make friends for yourselves by this unrighteous resource, money, this spirit, unrighteous. And so some people are like, well, what does that mean? I'm supposed to make friends with money. Do I lord it over people? Do I leverage it to like make friends? No, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying here is use the unrighteous wealth or resources of this world to bless people, to do good, to, to make a difference. And then he says this, that when you fail, they, meaning those, friend, those people you bless and you made a difference, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Now, that word fail isn't a good translation in this one. It's the same Greek word for death. That's what it means. So here's what he's saying. Make friends with your resources. Bless them. Make a difference in their life with the unrighteous wealth of this world. Use it to make a difference in people's lives so that when you die, those people that you bless will actually receive you in the kingdom of heaven and say, you bought me that Starbucks. You didn't know, but when you gave me that card, I gave my life to Jesus. You don't know the difference you made in my life when you stopped, when you prayed, when you blessed me. Those people are going to be the ones that receive you in your everlasting home. Now look what he says. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is also unjust in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, the the wealth of this world, the resources... Who will commit to your trust the what? True riches. Now, what are true riches again? Remember, the word of God and people. So look what God is saying. This is what Jesus is making the connection again, you guys. He's saying what is choking out true riches, the reason why the word of God is not producing fruit in your life is because you've got a divided mind. You bought into the lies of the deceitfulness of wealth and the pursuit of more stuff, and God wants to bless you with true riches, the word of God in your life, but it's getting choked out by how you are handling unrighteous mammon. And God wants to bless you with the true riches of people, but those are the people that actually you love the most, that you hurt the most because you're buying into the lies of the enemy. Oh, these are the true riches. This is what's getting choked out because of the deceitfulness of wealth. 
because of our pursuit of stuff. God says, I want to bless you. I want to pour out true riches. My word, my promises, it can work in your life. It can bear fruit in your life. I got people that I want to put around you that are going to love you, they are going to bless you, that you're going to bless and you're going to love. That's what true riches are, but the reason why you're not ready for them. You're not. I can't, I can't bless you with your riches because your mind's divided. It's all connected. It's all connected to how you see wealth, how you handle your resources. See, it's not really about that. You thought it's about the money and the stuff. It's not about that to Jesus. It's not. Stop making it. God doesn't care about your income. He cares about your outcome, okay? So it's not about that. It's always about this. It's, it's, it's about your heart, setting your heart on the right things, Setting your heart on giving, not getting. Setting your heart on true riches. He, got, he says, who's going to commit to you if you can't handle this unrighteous man and true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, meaning that wasn't yours to begin with, God gave you that. Amen? God gave you that. If you can't be faithful in what is another man's, who's going to give you what is your own? And then he says this, no servant can serve two masters. Okay, uh, I want, uh, for either he's going to hate the one and love the other, and to which some of you go, well, I don't hate God, well, I love God, I just have a hard time with this, you know, sometimes I, I, and I want this, but I also want that, and sometimes I, I believe, and sometimes I, I don't, so let me, Jesus kind of, he, he explains a little further, he goes, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other, and, and, and so, so what you don't realize is, is what you're doing when when you're, when you're having a double mind and a divided heart, that you're, you're being disloyal to God. You are despising or rejecting God by believing some. I'm put this part is, I give it to God this part. No, 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 no. Maybe you wouldn't, and this is the challenging part of the gospel. It really is, because Jesus said, those who love me, obey me. They obey me. And, and, and he says this, he, he ends it with this. He says, you, look, guys, you cannot serve God and mammon. You, you cannot have it both ways. Some of you would do really well to chop off an arm. I'm just kidding. Don't do it. But some of you would to not have the option to weigh it out, to be able to say no matter what comes off the wall, I'm doing it God's way. No matter what comes off the wall, what bounces, if it's a promotion, or if it's, if it's this, or if it's a relationship, no matter what's coming at me, I'm predeciding. I got one option. I'm doing it God's way. I'm, you know what happened? You know what happened? Peace. Perfect. Peace. You know what happened? The word of God would not be getting choked. There'd be fruit from the word. There would be, you know what happened? True riches would happen in your life if you just made up your mind to not be right and left, man, but to just whatever's coming off the wall, God, I'm doing your way. Y'all receiving this today, you guys? Are you with me, okay? Okay, here's, where do we set our heart? It comes back to the heart, back to the heart, back to the heart. We get the heart right, everything else lines up, okay? It's all, it's all right here, okay? So what's the last heart set? We're told, we're told to set our heart, not on this earth, but on heaven. That's, that's the right heart set. When it really comes down to it, the reason why we become unfaithful in, with the resources that God has given us so generously, let's admit it, we put our hearts on the wrong place, on the wrong things. We allowed this stuff to take precedence. We allowed this thing to take our affection. We, uh, we, allowed, we started to pursue that instead of him. We started to run after, to drive and to strive and to pursue more of that instead of more of him. We allowed this to happen, this divide to happen in our life. We were deceived. And we put our heart here on earth, on this stuff. When Colossians chapter 3, here's what it tells us. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds not on this stuff that doesn't last. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. I've been praying for you guys all week that this is an area of 
when it comes to the peace of God that he wants us to access, to, to walk in. Some of you desire it, but something is choking. Something is choking the fruit of God, the, the peace of God, the, the promises of God, like bearing the fruit that it was intended. And, and, and for some of us, it's because it's we haven't done the gardening. We haven't tilled the soil. We haven't gotten rid of the weeds. Which Jesus says, these weeds, these, it's causing the divide of our mind. It, it's, it's, we bought into some lies about money. We thought it would make us secure, make us happy, make us significant. We thought the things of this world would, would, would actually scratch the itch, and it just didn't. It. it just produced more anxiety and you know, more, more heartache and more conflict and more, more, more. Pursuit of more just brought more problems with it. it's time we set our heart right. And some of you here today, and you just know, the Holy Spirit's tugging on your heart, man. And there's, there's some light that's being shined in different areas. I like to think of it like the Holy Spirit just is like a light. He just shines in areas just, that maybe we didn't, we didn't know that we're there. That's what his word does. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Just a light shines. And we go, oh, is that what that was? I've been misdiagnosing this thing. I thought it was that, but it's actually, it's actually this. No, it's a heart set what it is. You get your heart set on the right thing and it falls into order. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.